how to produce or read structural documentation, something that you will need day in, day out, as it's critical to any role as a structural engineer. Concrete structural documentation at first glance can seem quite complex. However, it is really easy when you break down the simple steps. And it's about building up the layers of documentation that you're looking at. So I'll be going through some tips and tricks on how to document your structures to make it more easy to build, to make it less intimidating. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. So let's start off with the basics. And when we first grab our structural documentation set, it generally has an index page at the start. So it lists all the drawings in the documentation set and laying out the order that they'll be placed in. Generally, you start off with general notes or specifications for the drawings as these need to be read prior to any construction. And then you normally start off from the bottom up. So you'll be at the excavation stage, moving up to the piling stage, and then any floors up above that, which is slightly opposed to what design is. As generally, you need to find where the loads are at the top, follow them through the building. Construction starts from the bottom up and that's how we document our drawings. But then you also have your standard details, so typical details across all drawing sets. And sometimes depending on the company that you're working for, they could be at the start of the documentation set or they could be at the end, but they're generally grouped together. So if we first start looking at this bulk excavation drawing, you can see a number of things. We've got the external pile retention system as we need to retain back that soil. As this is something that needs to go in first, you need to drill your piles in and build your shotcrete walls to allow the excavation to continue. So we can see they're quite prominent on this drawings. In this drawing, you can also see that we've got some soil nails and soil anchors as these poles are obviously getting a little bit too high. They need some way of holding it back. You can clearly see where the bulk excavation lines are. So we've got a battle line in there that we're highlighting and different potential RL levels if we need to show that depending on the level of documentation that we need to provide. And so we can also see other elements such as tanks, or any footings that they may need to consider into the future so they can plan out their excavation. So we've got the bottom of the lift pit at the center there and we're highlighting some of the critical areas. Also on this drawing, you can see off to the right-hand side, a dashed line for an existing building, as this is somewhat critical, especially for the excavation, as it may limit how close you can go to the boundary and something they need to consider. So highlighting any of the existing structures that may limit or inhibit the construction of the building. In this as well, you can also see there is a dashed line. So any services that may be critical or they may need to consider would also be shown on this documentation. After they've done their bulk excavation, they potentially show pad footings if you got them, or if you potentially need higher loads or the soil is quite poor. As we can see here, we've got piling systems so we've got some areas that have highlighted off here as there's still some additional coordination as we need to highlight to the builder that this is not yet finalized. On this drawing, we've got this line down the center that splits the difference between what a piling plan will look like and the footing plan. So you can see how they slightly change between the two sets. So on the piling plan, we've got the pad footings dashed in those locations. You may actually show the depth of them as well as they'll need to know the cutoff depths of those piles. However, the prominent part of that plan is the piles as they're the critical thing that they're building off that plan. Don't forget to conquer that like button. Not only does it help me out, but it also gets it out to more people. However, if we go around to the footing side, we can see something slightly different. So the dashed lines that were shown on the left-hand side for the piling are now solid as they're now the critical point of this drawing. On this plan as well, sometimes you may actually even call up the different pad footings as you may have a PF1, a PF2, and a PF3 as they may have different reinforcement in them. You may also show the depth and the breadth of the pile caps. Also on the footing plan, you can also see that the prominent nature of the columns over, the columns have become more prominent in these locations. As opposed to the piling plan, as you don't really care where the columns are, you just care about their location approximately. However, when you're building your pad footing, they are, as you'll need to put additional starter bars out there. And you may actually even call up the columns and go to a column schedule plan to find out what starter bars need to come out of the pile caps. So we're moving up a little bit now that we've built our pile caps. The next plan above that would be the slab on ground or SOG sometimes for short. On the SOG plan, you'd be showing the dash tanks underneath as you potentially need to span over them. You'd be showing any soffit steps as potentially some locations need a deeper slab. So you'd be showing a dash line showing that the bottom of the slab has actually stepped down making a deeper section. Another item that you can also see that's actually been brought into this set as well now that we're looking at a slab is obviously the depth of the slab. So we've got a 250 marked on the plan showing that the slab in this location is 250 and then we move over where we had the soffit step. We've also got a 300 thick as we've got a thicker slab in in that location for some reason. You can also see that there is a set down on this plan. So as you can see this line that looks like a step with a hash pattern on the bottom. This is showing that the top of the slab steps. Now it's got a solid line as potentially you're looking down on this plan. So anything with a solid line is the edge of the slab and the dash line would be beneath the top of the slab as you can't see it. 
its dash, so it's hidden from your view, hence the dash line. The other things you can also see that are hidden in this location are also the pad footings, as potentially you're turning down onto these locations. We've got our first suspended slab, and we can see there's a fair bit more information shown on this plan. So if we're starting off with the basic principles, you obviously need to show the edge of your slab. So what is the extent of your slab and what voids are through there? So if we've got the highlighter, we can see the cross sections are showing that there is a void in the slab in these locations. The next thing that is critical is obviously the depth of your either slab structures or beam structures, as they need to be able to build the soffit steps in the, any formwork that they need to construct. We can see that we've got beams hashed here. Now this could be a quite a controversial topic because some engineers go, no, they shouldn't be hashed. Some engineers say they should. Sometimes it provides clarity. Me personally, I don't really like the hash unless you've got a lot of different beams and you need to show it for clarity. However, in this location, we can see that we've hashed to highlight it. However, it's just really user preference at this point. And you can see the soffit lines. As we're looking down on the plan, we can't see the step in the concrete underneath. So it's dashed, so it's hidden from view. Another thing that's highly critical on this plan is showing any of the columns under. And so we're highlighting the support locations that the slab is supported off. And these are shown typically dashed under if they're just under or if they're over and under, you'll have a solid line showing that there is a column over and under in these locations. We're also showing columns that are over only as these are important as well. They're not as important as the structure underneath. Now for a design point of view, yes, they're highly critical, but if you're building a slab from bottom up, the things that you're about to see when you're starting to form up that slab is the starter bars or reinforcement coming out of the slabs. And again, similar to this slab on ground, we've got our soffit lines dash. So if we're going to sit down for whatever reason, as we're seeing in the beams, we've got our dash lines in the soffit steps. This can also be for a slab change as well. We've also got our set downs for, for the top of the slabs. Now, depending on where you are in the world, in Australia, we typically don't call up the depth changes of these. So we're not doing the setup. That's typically left to the architect. But I know did the different countries similar to like the UK will actually provide those set out. So allowing them to have a little bit more control of the construction of these slab locations. So typically in Australia, what we will be doing would we'll be showing minimum depth. So if we do have a soffit step for whatever reason, we'll have a minimum depth of the slab in that location, but we will not call up the actual physical step height. So if we're looking at these plans, it's also important to show any ramps. So we can see ramps off to the bottom right-hand corner here. It's also important that we also know such thing as stairs. And if stairs may be shown slightly differently as the stairs need additional starter bars or other items coming out of the slab, especially if they're reinforced concrete. So they're also critical for the design as they potentially put additional load. Drawing sets are normally laid out in a way that they're going to be constructed. So we just talked about our general arrangement plan that showed the depth of folds or voids for the slab. So then after we've got our general arrangement plan, in the order you generally go on to bottom reinforcement as this is the reinforcement they need to lay out before they start anything. So now if we're looking at our bottom reinforcement plan here, we can see we've got a slightly different building, but it's still showing the same information. So we can see that the columns dashed underneath, we've got the solid lines for the columns over or wall supports. You can also see edge reinforcements. Normally those reinforcements are called up in a certain way. So normally you've got the designation of the bar. You may call up how many bars there are. You may call up the length of those bars. You may also call up what centers they're at. So if they're continuous along a whole area, you potentially will only call up the centers. But generally on this plan, you're just showing what is required in the bottom layer of the slab. So we're looking at this drawing now, we can see that we've got grid lines. We've got horizontal grid lines of one, two, three, four, five along the drawing set. And also then we've got A, B, C, D, E. So what that allows you to do when you're on any site, potentially you don't know where you are on the drawing. So it allows you to quickly reference certain locations and distances off certain grid lines, typically left for the architect. So the architect will set out the grid lines and the locations of the columns, but we also put it on our drawing as a cross reference. So if they're looking at anything, it allows them to quickly look at the two drawings to locate where they are on a certain plan. So now let's move up to the post tension plan as typically when you're constructing any post tension slab, you've got bottom reinforcement, post tensioning, top reinforcement. So the post tensioning is sandwiched between the bottom mat and the top mat of reinforcement. In the post tension plan, you'll need to obviously show the tendons. Now you may either show all the tendons like we're showing here, or you may just show extent lines and what centers they'll be at. But for the post tension tendons, you need to show a live end. So where they stress it from the dead end. So where they terminate the post tensioning and also the heights that they put out. So what chair height do you need? You will need to show the, typically the high points and where the low points of those cables are to allow them to be set out. 
In this plan as well, you can also see that there was also a construction joint documented because they potentially can't pull the whole slab in one go. So it's allowing for where those termination points are and what additional reinforcement you'll need in there. In addition to the post tension cables, you also need to call up what size they are. So there's a number of different ranges of tendons that you may have. Typically, you won't mix between your 12.7s and your 15.2s. However, you may have a three cable or four cable or five cables. So you need to know on the plan how many tendons are in each. Now, sometimes you may have the same tendon across the whole drawing, so you may cover it in a general note, but there is some way of notating how many cables are in each tendon. And then when looking up, so we now we need to lay our top reinforcement mat. And again, similar to the bottom reinforcement, we're calling out what bar size we've got. So in this typical detail, we've got N12s. And again, now we're calling out how many bars we need and what centers we need them at. As we can see, we're also calling up an extent line that we're putting the reinforcement is. We need the bar to extend a certain distance from the edge of the column, as opposed to calling up specific length, as we don't really care how long they are. We just need to make sure they extend beyond a certain location. If you're interested in supporting the channel, we've got links to my Patreon in the below description. Much like these many patrons here, without their support, these type of episodes would not be possible. And if you have enjoyed this content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.